in her book, Daring Greatly, Renee Brown, reflects on modern society's penchant for dehumanizing one another. She writes, last week while I was trying to enjoy my manicure, I watched in horror as the two women across from me talked on their phones the entire time they were getting their nails done. They employed head nods, eyebrow raises, and finger pointing to instruct the manicurists on things like nail length and polish choices. I really couldn't believe it. I have had my nails done by the same two women for 10 years. I know their names, their real Vietnamese names, their children's names, and many of their stories. They know my name, my children's names, and many of my stories. When I finally made a comment about the women on their cell phones, both of my manicurists quickly averted their eyes. Finally, in a whisper, my manicurist said, they don't know. Most of them don't think of us as people. Brown goes on to recount a number of other similar moments throughout her day, from a Barnes & Noble store to a fast food drive through people being short, demanding, treating the person on the other side of the counter more like a vending machine than a person. Brown reflects, when we treat people as objects, we dehumanize them. We do something really terrible, both to their souls and to our own. She goes on to mention 20th century philosopher Martin Buber's distinction between I-it relationships and I-thou relationships. An I-it relationship is what we create when we are in transactions with people whom we treat like objects. I-you relationships are characterized by human connection, human empathy. In an I-you relationship, we see one another. We recognize the humanity and worth of one another. Buber wrote, when two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. Which brings us to the well, to a stunning I-you encounter between Jesus and a Samaritan woman. If I may speak personally for a moment, this story more than any other is responsible for my own personal transformation. This is the story that broke through my soul and allows me to do what I do today. After all, this Samaritan woman was, in reality, the first preacher. She gave me permission to follow in her footsteps. I've shared before that I was raised in a tradition that strictly barred women from having voice in the church. They were to do, of course, all of the work, but have none of the say. Women's gifts were lesser. They were to be modest, supportive of the men, and mostly silent. They could teach children or younger women, but never, ever teach men. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2 says that an overseer in the church must, among other things, be the husband of one wife. As my pastor father put it in his literal interpretation of that passage, the day a woman can be the husband of one wife, she can be a deacon in my church. Now for most of you this sounds as foreign as Zimbabwe. Obviously this is not who we are at Westwood Presbyterian Church. And we have come a long way, both as a church and as a society, in recognizing that the world suffers when women or any people who are treated as second-class citizens, if citizens at all. And yet, as the events of the past couple of weeks have painfully shown, we've still a very long way to go. Back to the well which again this time brings us something new. The story seems so innocuous on its surface, but it is in reality explicit.
explosive in its upending of societal norms. John tells us that Jesus had decided to pass through Samaria, which would cause anyone reading this story in his day to say, uh oh, this is not going to go well. Jews and Samaritans hated one another. A long standing bitter feud between ethnic cousins. The early reader would also have been stunned that the main character in the story is a female. Women and men did not generally speak to one another in public. And thus the woman is shocked when Jesus, a Jew and a male, asks her, a woman and a Samaritan, for a drink. Responding to her surprise, Jesus offers her living water. And what ensues is the longest theological discussion recorded in the Gospels. A woman doing theology. Imagine that. Eventually, Jesus asks her to call her husband. She states that she has no husband, but Jesus seems to know that already. You have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband, he says. And with that statement, the whole of Christian history has branded this woman loose. Perhaps prostitute, a common whore. Theologian David Loves provides insight. He writes there is absolutely nothing in this text that allows us to make that assumption. Jesus at no point invites repentance or speaks of her as sinful. She very easily could have been widowed or could have been abandoned or divorced. Remember, by law, men could divorce women, but women did not have that same privilege or right. Five times would be heartbreaking, certainly not impossible. Further, she could now be living with someone that she was dependent upon in what's called a leveret marriage, which does not technically make her someone's wife. There are any number of ways, in fact, that one might imagine this woman's story as simply tragic rather than scandalous. Most writes, Yet most preachers assume the latter. And I confess I am guilty as charged. Over my lifetime, I have not read one commentator who has not diminished and devalued this woman because of her supposed immoral character. And I have bought that storyline, hook, line, and sinker, all the way this week. And I repent of having thought and spoken of this nameless woman as a woman of ill repute in this my most favorite gospel story. I have misrepresented and diminished her very personhood. And for that I am sorry. Los asks, why do so many preachers assume the worst of her? And then he responds, there is a long history of misogyny in Christian theology that stands in sharp contrast to the important role women play in the gospel themselves. Women supported Jesus' ministry financially. They were present at the tomb when their male companions fled, and they were the first witnesses to the resurrection. And yet, from asserting that Eve was the one who succumbed to the temptation, conveniently ignoring that the author of Genesis clearly says that Adam was right there with her, to assuming this Samaritan woman must be a prostitute, there is the ugly taint of chauvinism underlying much of Christianity's discourse and behavior. And yet we see none of this in Jesus. Case in point, to Jesus, the Samaritan woman is neither a second-class citizen nor an object to be diminished or abused. She is a child of God, made in God's image. She has value and worth. She is fully a person. What we see between Jesus and the woman echoes Buber's words. When two people relate to each other authentically 
and humanly. God is the electricity that surges between them. I wrestled all week with whether or not to address the misogyny filling our airwaves and public discourse. I didn't really decide to go for it until Friday morning, thus no title in your bulletin today. I feared that some would think I was being self-serving. After all, I am a woman with a lifetime of painful experiences of being diminished and dismissed because of my gender. And yes, I'm sick to death of it. I feared others would think I was being political. But this is not about politics. As we have seen all too often in legislation, in tweets, in emails, and all over the internet, misogyny runs rampant on both sides of the aisle, as well as among the apolitical, the religious, the a-religious. This is a human matter. I fear that still others would hear this as an anti-male sermon. Note, I happen to be married to a male, and I love him madly. But this is far from a male issue alone. Misogyny is in the cultural air we breathe. Both men and women perpetuate misogynistic attitudes, and both suffer greatly from it. In the end of the day, obviously, I decided, albeit with a bit of fear and trembling, that to pass up this moment would be irresponsible. To women, to men, to our children, to our church, to our community, to our world. Fundamentally, this is a spiritual issue, a matter about which God has much to say. Misogyny from the Greek misogynia, the same to hate, to women, to hate women. Or as the Oxford Dictionary further defines it, it is the delight, dis dislike of, contempt for, or ingrained prejudice against women. Or as former President Jimmy Carter puts it, it is the global assumption that men and boys are superior to women and girls. An unexamined prejudice rooted so deeply in our global psyche that we return, routinely accept it as normal, as acceptable. Boys will be boys, we say. And the effects are devastating on so many levels. And we have too little time to fully explore all of the ways that privileging men over women shreds the fabric of humanity. That would take days. But a snapshot of the damage. In the aftermath of our most recent debacle, author Kelly Oxford shared on Twitter the story of the first time she was sexually assaulted. And she went on to invite others to share the stories of their first sexual assault. And then only one evening, more than a million responses poured in. In 140 characters, women told their stories. They shared their guilt, their anger and shame, their scars. And the harm, obviously, is not only for women. When we treat someone as an object, when we diminish and dismiss another based on gender, we damage our own souls. We become a little less human, a little more cramped, unable to create the authentic human condition, connection for which we are all hardwired and for which we all long. And as women and men of faith, part of our work is to push against unfaithful cultural norms. Because we carry in us a different vision, a vision woven throughout our sacred text. It is all right there. Beginning with the very words of creation, 
Note that God does not point to Adam and say, you alone are created in my image. Eve is your inferior, yours to own and diminish, dismiss and to use. Rather, the text is clear. Eve bears the divine image in the same way as Adam. And she and all who will follow are of equal value and worth. It begins there and it makes its all the way through, all the way to Jesus, whose ways with women were so counter to his culture's norm. Always respectful, always honoring. Never does he turn to the guys and say, you know, being the salt of the earth is a male-only gig. Jesus always took women seriously as persons not as objects or as bodies to be consumed. He treated them with the same dignity he treated men, and not because they were someone's daughter, someone's sister, someone's mother, but because they themselves were fully human, and therefore of full value and worth. Perhaps the gift of these sordid couple of weeks is that they have brought into full view what is always lurked, at times unnoticed and almost always unacknowledged, and it is not okay. As followers in the ways of Jesus, we are called to live differently, to make sure in all of our relationships that our own attitudes are shaped by God's vision of equality and respect. We are called to speak up in our churches, our businesses, our institutions, our communities when something dismissive or demeaning is said or done. We are called to examine our language, to make sure that our words do not perpetuate the global norm that men and boys are superior to women and girls. We are called to consider how we behave toward one another. And whether that behavior reflects attitudes and assumptions in keeping the attitudes and assumptions of God. We are to be diligent as we raise our children, that we not reduce our little girls to their appearance, and subtly encourage our little boys to be little devils. As I was Starting this sermon, my husband Gary asked, as he often does, where is the good news? The good news is this. God shows us a different way, a better way of being with one another. A way that heals our souls and makes authentic human connection and relationship possible. As St. Augustine wrote, years ago that God loves each one of us as if there were only one of us to love, with no mention of any specific color, orientation, social status, or gender. In a world that classifies, objectifies, and judges, that, dear friends, is very good news. Good news that allows us the electricity that is God to surge between us. Let us pray. Lord, forgive us. With compassion, tend to our deep wounds. Make us relentless in our efforts to affirm and celebrate our common humanity, to fix this brokenness that is shredding our souls, to find your way forward. We pray in Jesus who has shown us the way. Amen and amen.